Hello, welcome to hashtag Ask GMBN Tech, which is quite a lot harder to say than I thought it was. Uh, and we've got lots of questions, and you can ask questions on any of our videos uh, just by putting the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech um, in the comments below. So just put them all in, ask any questions. Yeah, right we will now. try and answer them all. Mm. Um, so yeah, first question. Speaking of questions, uh, D1, a very catchy name says, I have a Canyon Stoic 329er. Can I change this to a mixed wheel setup with a 27.5 in the rear? Yes. I mean, it's the short answer. Of course, you can put a small wheel in the back and it will suddenly be a mixed wheel setup. Um, but your bike wasn't designed to do that, so do bear in mind that that's going to change the geometry. Uh, a smaller wheel comes with a sort of a smaller axle height as well, so you're going to sort of drop the back end, which means you might have slacker angles in the front, but also in your seat tube, um, so you might not want to change that angle. Uh, but it only be slightly. You can sort of pad it out with bigger tyres a little bit to try and bring it back up. Um, luckily, you're on a hardtail, so it's a slightly easier process than with full suspensions that might need linkage changes and whatnot to not affect the rear suspension. Um, but what I will say is there can be some clearance issues with the tires because now that you've got a smaller wheel, it comes backwards towards the axle and it might move itself towards a sort of a closer, curvier uh, chainstay, if you will, which might be an issue. So do check the clearance before you start riding hard on that thing. Yeah, but, but let us know how it goes. It'd be really oh, yeah. good to see. Yeah. Uh, top mod, please upload it. Great question here. Great question. Uh, yeah, yeah, great question. I mean, they're all great. That's they're what we love answering. Great. It's true. Uh, this is from C. John 1984 03. Is it possible to make my free hub louder? Um, I like noisier hubs, but mine is quiet. Is there something <laughs> I can do? Um, I mean, effectively, yes. I mean, there's lots of kind of asterisks there because it depends on what free hub you've got mm. and how you can change it. So, I mean, lots of the noise is from the, the pause clicking and moving around, so whether it's like a DT Swiss style hub where it's like a star ratchet that clicks together or it's individual pause uh, as you'd have in well, lots of other systems. Um, so, yeah, those pause are often kind of like damped not damped on purpose, but more damped by the grease that's in there. That grease is doing something good, which is keeping kind of rust and grit and water and all the kind of rubbish stuff that you don't want in a kind of like fine-toothed system. Um, so, uh, yeah, you can. Trials riders often do it. Downhill racers sometimes do it. XC racers probably do it too. Mm. Um, effectively, you can take that grease out and put a light lubricant in like an oil. But just be mindful that you'll need to pay a lot more attention to checking it and maintaining it. Um, but that should make it louder. I mean, I'd ask, do you, why do you want it louder? Because <laughs> loud is better. -er. Is it? Uh, right, okay, well, some hubs are I mean, more noisier than others. Yeah, some yeah. people who don't maintain their hubs certainly have some very loud hubs, and I would be worried about okay. that. Okay, right, yeah, no, that's Because that's probably the grease wearing out. Yeah, uh, but there's people who make uh, sort of like a sprag clutch system. Um, it works completely differently, and it's a bit too hard to describe, but Onyx make, make these silent hubs. And actually, Shimano in the past have done a silent hub. Um, I quite like it, to be honest. I love a silent hub. Yeah. Sneaking up on people, it's the best, especially well, no, when you're racing got a bell. <laughs> No? Um, no. Yeah, so play around, let us know. I mean, um, yeah, just be mindful that if you're taking grease out, um, that, yeah, the grease is there for a, a reason. Um, it's also prolonging the life of the hub as well. So yeah, it's it, protecting over, it from a lot of wear. It's going to yeah. get worn out as well, so it's not super ideal. Yeah, but yeah, it's possible. But you can do it. Okay, from username at uh, sorry, we've lost your name. Uh, apologies. Um, I loved my XTR rapid rise derailleur back in the day. Um, more old tat here. You're going to be loving this Great. question. But they seem to come and go very quickly. What was the problems um, that they were trying to solve? Um, why are they still not around, basically? Um, well, the problem they were trying to solve, so rapid rise effectively worked in the opposite way to a normal derailleur, or the common derailleur we see now. Cable. Is the ca yeah. yeah, sorry, a very good point, is the cable tensioned man um, mechanical derailleur. Effectively, the tension will open out your derailleur, so the parallelogram will work in such a way that it will get to the bigger cogs, so the easier cogs at the back, whereas Rapid Rise um, would actually sort of get, it would expand, wouldn't it? So it would yeah, fall so into the bigger cogs it and would you would use tension. Into, yeah, so the spring in the rear the mech opposed cog. to like 
compressing it and making the rear mech it works small. Works in the opposite way. Yeah, effectively. the spring oh, like pulled the the whole rear mech open, mm. as you've said. So yeah, the advantages to it were that it was a bit easier on your thumbs, so opposed to having to like push up the cassette and push against that spring. Mm. The mech was helping you, um, and that they makes were... total sense to me mechanically. Yeah, yeah I know mechanically there was some advantages. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess the reason why they didn't really take off is that there were some issues with like they were being a little bit more finickety uh, than other nine-speed systems. Um, Mega Nine was the, the kind of like system at the time. I mean, nine-speed was really easy to set up, so that it was very minor issues. I think the bigger issue, uh, from my understanding, I mean, obviously everyone out there who's had a rapid riser. Rear mech, get in touch with yeah. us. The other problem was that it was the opposite. So when you're on your bike and you'd got one bike without it and you'd got a kind of low normal or normal rear mech, you'd kind of like push the thumb shifter uh, and you'd go up a cog. This would release it. So it was completely <laughs> counterintuitive. So that was a bit of a kind of tricky one to get across. Um, and, and then the other... Did people not like the shifter as well? Well, there was regular shifters, so just like a normal rapid fire shifter that was under your bar, but they it also was kind of introduced at the same time that um, Shimano introduced what were called dual control levers. They did these in cable and hydraulic iterations and effectively best described as flappy paddle levers, <laughs> um, which I think for a flat bar gravel bike would be amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What happened was that you would change gear bit like on a road bike where you would push the lever itself. I think for XC Marathon there's the potential that it could work in some situations. This was to combat Grip Shift who were making big waves, now a little company called SRAM, you might have heard of them, um, big waves in, in kind of like Shimano's ocean of uh, isolation. Uh, so yeah they were trying to think of different ways of shifting and that was their approach. Unfortunately it was, yeah, it was probably one of the only things where Shimano got it really, really wrong. I don't know if it was wrong, but I think, you know, trying to change the game is always a difficult roll of the dice, isn't it? So I guess there were so many factors that made people think, eh, I'm not too sure about this, that eventually it just died out. I, I think out. that's really polite. I feel like you're angling for a trip to Japan. <laughs> Shimano, think... is she going and I'm not? Yeah. Is that the thing? Bring back Rapid Rise. I'm on board. There you go, okay. Okay, my next question from Dan Justin arose. Uh, hi, Anna. Oh, hi. Um, huge fan of the channel. A uh, quick question, is it? Is it possible to reduce the travel of a RockShox Pike or Yari? I'm currently running a Rocky Mountain Fusion with 100mm travel Suntour XCT forks. Um, potentially, yes, you can adjust the travel on most RockShox forks, um, but that is sort of model dependent and dependent on where you're starting and where you want to go to. Um, possibly yes, I would say, I don't know uh, what model you're looking at, but do go and speak to a specialist, like um, a, a suspension specialist, because they can do this work for you as well if you don't want the work, because it will require opening out your forks and pulling out the internals, perhaps the air spring, and changing it over for a correctly sized one. So taking out a 140 or 130, whatever you've got in that pike, and putting a 100 mil um, spring in there so it can now be 100 mils. Um, and that's one of the great things about Rock Shorts. I've done this myself on a pike um, and changed it down into a small size. I've actually sized up into a bigger size as well and taken a 130 to 150. Um, but yeah, as I say, go and have a look at um, a specialist that can just sort of have a look at the models that you're looking at. Um, but I wonder if really you want to do that because it means buying a whole fork and then going and buying the internals for it as well. And then if you're not doing the work yourself, you're then also spending maybe 100 quid on labour as well to change that over. Uh, maybe it might be better off just looking for a 100 mil fork if 100 no, mils I, is I'm what I'm going to say want. get a 120. Really? You looked at the geometry on the... <laughs> On the Rocky Mountain Fusion. <laughs> Looks like a great bike. 100 mil fork, nice enough. Switch to a 120. Okay, it's going to mm. get a tiny bit slacker, but not a lot. Uh, mm. um, I mean, obviously, double Maybe check with Rocky Mountain. Maybe a degree off your 66 degree head yeah, but angle. That's great. That's wild. No, yeah, but it's a hardtail. It's only going to get <laughs> steeper, so it's fine. I genuinely think <laughs> yeah. stick a 120 on there. Um, obviously, check with Rocky Mountain. Please don't just go with what I've said because I've could you be may wrong. avoid your they warranty. Could, yeah, they may avoid the warranty because there's more load with a longer fork. But yeah, I've got a longer travel fork on a on a hundred mil hardtail. I think it's a one thirty, which is over forky, a mm. bit too much. But with a nice amount of sag, which you can run and you can play with the air yeah. volume, so it does still have ramp up 
and lots of sag. It's a it's a great bike, and on yeah. a hardtail, you only get a steeper head angle. I have so. overforked a nukeproof scout before, and it was delightful. There you I go. I must admit, I just ran a bit more sag, and it was nice. See, it's fun. Exactly. There we go. Um, but yeah, if you're buying a 120 fork anyway, then why not try it out? But maybe don't try out a 140. That might be a little bit too much. Okay, we've got a question now from the Marvinator. Whoa. I wonder if there's, yeah, a Marvin who works a locally. Yeah, maybe it's him. Are you writing Tom in? Marvin. Wow, that'd be great. <laughs> um, he's worked out his ideal crank length Ooh. to be 161.2. Specific. With an online calculator. Cool. Uh, so do I go for a 160 or 165 crank? Uh, current cranks are 175. What size do I go for? Okay, in the grand scheme of things, I think, yeah, the 0.1 of a mil when you're coming down from 15 mil won't make that much difference. So I'd probably, I mean, it depends on your bike. That would be a big thing. If you're yeah. on an e-bike, I would definitely push you towards a 160 bike. Mm. If you're not on an e-bike, and you're on an acoustic, maybe the 165 might be better. And I say not from the ergonomic perspective, but purely because it's actually really hard to get 160 cranks for quite a lot of Shimano stuff. Yes, I, had a, I had a quick look. Yeah. There's yeah, not that many so. out there, and not that many in stock, so short cranks are popular. Um, but you've done a video on different crank lengths, I did. You? I tried uh, 175, then I moved down to 155 and 145 as well. And they do feel really differently. And go and watch that video because my conclusion, um, roughly, there's a lot to it. But if you're um, on XC, you're going to feel very spinny because your crank lengths have come down. You're moving from 175 to 165. That's 10 mil off uh, the crank. So that's bringing your feet in 20 mil. It might feel like a really big difference and you're going to feel like you're in a really spinny gear um, and it might be not so fun on a long climb. Um, I really liked it for enduro descents. I really enjoyed having my feet closer in. It squared off my hips. I felt more stable and I felt like I could drive more power through through the bike, uh, pumping lips and jumping. Um, however, it's not for everyone. Rich hated going down size and he likes wider sizes, so. But his bike fit is quite unique. In the fact <laughs> he that is He unique. might have been on the wrong <laughs> size bike for a he little might. bit of time, so. So when you use a calculator, it's giving you a circa number, but like there is a lot of um, personal preference and personal ergonomics that's going to come into that. And also you tend to sort of size up for cross country and size down for downhill and you might be somewhere in the middle, who knows? Yeah, I guess the other factor is that all those factors add up to changing your bike fit. So yeah, 160 might be optimised position, but then it's going to have lots of knock-on effects. So maybe the 165 is the better compromise because A, you can... It's easier them. to find. Yeah, it's easier to sure. find, and then you can, you know, yeah. you can change your saddle position to help with the, the sort of like yeah, knee yeah. over pedal spindle. Saddle height's going to have to come down as well. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So then your like knee over pedal spindle will, will like position will change. If relative bar height will change, effectively all of your bar bike fit will change. Mm. So it's definitely a factor, but think of all the other factors that are impacted by it. Yeah, maybe get a secondhand 165 first from eBay. Ooh, Try it out great chance. and see what you think. And my final question from Daniel Barstrom, who says, I live in the northern part of Europe where we have long periods of snow in the winter. Uh, what are the key things to check on the bike when it's time for that new bike season? Uh, question mark, brakes, sealant. Uh, thanks and keep shredding. Um, you, do you know what? It, if you've had your bike in storage, it doesn't matter whether it's cold or warm or whatever. If you had your bike in storage for a while, it is a good idea to pretty much check any, everything because why not? I mean, your tyres will eventually go down anyway, especially if they're in hot conditions. Um, your air pressure may change in your suspension. You certainly want to check that and get it back up to the right um, spec for you. Uh, things like um, brakes. I mean, if you have dot, for example, rather than mineral, we know that that starts to take on air over time and so they can get spongy. Uh, but even if you've got mineral, I would check them anyway. Give them a good squeeze at the very least. You'll see whether they're spongy or not or just take the time to go and bleed them anyway because it's a good thing to do before a new season yeah i think it's that thing of just it helps with building the stoke again of us to just all oh, right it's time to ride again so yeah, yeah checking your bike over i think you're right about the, the brake bleed thing even the best systems i think sram are saying with because they've now got dot and mineral setups they're saying with the dot the minimum of a bleed every year and that's without putting it into sort of cold storage so yeah. um and then, yeah, mineral is, a for them, a longer cycle. But again, I mm. think just giving brakes a bleed. If you're storing it 
in a different orientation, like if it's hanging up versus being down, yeah. that means that you can have fluid migrate and air possibly creep into places. So yeah, checking all the fluid levels and yeah, fluid sure as well. Talking prepped. of sealant, so sealant may, depending on whether you've got a largely a chemical based or water based, it may dry out quite quickly over time. So certainly the chemical ones do dry out quite quickly. Um, so you might want to pop open a tire and check your sealant levels in there. Uh, you might just have a little remlin in there. Yeah, you could. Yeah, just completely course, solidified. Yeah. So don't chance it at the start of the season. Give it a good check. Over and replace everything or maintain everything that needs maintaining. Yeah, and then your first ride in spring will just be incredible because mm. you're like, oh, Confidence. the bike's perfect. You've kind of like rolled your everything bars back a little bit, good. brakes are perfect, um, and you can enjoy <laughs> it. Apart from you've forgotten that, yeah, you might not have that fitness and you might have lost yeah. a bit of coordination. We'll talk about that though. But that's the bike fine, feels it'll be brilliant. good, and that's all that we care about. <laughs> Daniel's probably been snowboarding, he's probably been slaying that's it on the true. slopes, so he'll it's just transition shredded. really quickly. Yeah. Uh, well, that's all we've got time for. Thank you very much for your questions, and if anyone watching right now has any questions uh, burning up inside of them, use hashtag AskGMBNTech down in the comments right now, and we'll try and get back to you on a show like this. Thank you. Bye.